Artemis 1 launches successfully, keeping JWST safe from space dust. An impressive test for Starship, Chinese space debris, and a bright new satellite network has deployed. All this and more in this week's episode of Space Bites. Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years, and this is our Space Bites. Short, bite-sized space news that you can think about that's happened this week in space and astronomy. All right, let's get into the news. NASA's plans for micrometeoroids. We've had quite a lot of conversation about this, of course. JWST has been hit by a bunch of micrometeoroids. So far, they've been hit by 14 events that they've been able to track hitting the telescope's main mirror. Now, most of them, 13 of them, were fine. We're small, totally expected, and aren't going to really impact haha, the operation of the telescope at any point. Point. But one that happened back in May was surprisingly large, bigger than anything the engineers were expecting. And now that we know that JWST probably has propellant on board long enough for it to last at the L2 Lagrange point for like 25 years plus, they're really going to want to figure out ways to take care of this telescope for as long as possible. And so this fact that it's getting peppered occasionally by little pieces of space dust is something they're going to want to try to reduce. So this week, NASA came out and officially announced the plan. And that is that they're going to now change the orientation of the observations of the space telescope. So up until this point, the telescope has been turning around observing targets in its field of view. So sometimes it's looking upwards of its orbit, and other times it's looking backwards on its orbit. So when JBOST is looking forward in its orbit, the micrometeorites are hitting twice as hard as when it's looking backwards in its orbit, because essentially it's looking up and you're getting the velocity of the telescope going around the sun, as opposed to when it's looking backwards, and then you're able to cancel out that velocity. So it's a factor of two for the speed, but it's a factor of four for the amount of momentum that these particles are hitting the telescope with. And so the safest operation is to always turn back and observe targets that are in your own wake, apparently your orbital wake. And this is like another shout out for the interview that I did with Lee Feinberg, where he told us about the plan for Miri, he told us about the micrometeorite plan, and he told us that JWST is going to be lasting more than 25 years. So again, I know I keep saying this, but you've got to check out that interview. Now, it's not just news about the telescope itself. The telescope has taken another really incredible image. This one is of a protostar, so a star that is brand new. It's classified as a class zero protostar, one that is within the first 100,000 years of its formation. And when you look at this picture, you're seeing this hourglass shape. But if you zoom right into the neck part of the hourglass, you can actually see this little dark line. That is the accretion disk of material that is starting to form around the star itself. The star is obscured by this central region. And then you've got the light that is blasting out of the newly forming star and the accretion disk that is illuminating these cones on either side of the accretion disk. And over time, this star will continue to build up and gather more material. And eventually, it'll turn into a proper star, it'll blast out radiation that'll clear out all of the material, and it'll be left with whatever planets were able to form in this time. So it's really quite incredible to be able to catch a star in formation. And you should really compare you can look at other pictures that have been taken of this protostar and compare that to the quality that you get from JWST. And it's just, it's astounding. Once again, JWST really comes through and reveals another part of the universe for us that is really enshrouded in gas and dust and mystery. Artemis 1 finally launches. Well, it happened. Artemis 1 blasted off. What a relief. <laughs> so so a couple of people had mentioned that I didn't make a prediction last time about whether or not it would. But actually, when I think back, 
my prediction was at this point, we've got another month and a bit before we can see the rocket roll out to the pad again. And maybe this time they'll be able to launch as long as another hurricane doesn't roll through. So I'll keep you posted. So it did get hit by a hurricane, but then it looked good and no other hurricanes came. And so it was able to take off. So I, I stand by my prediction. The rocket blasted off on November 16th at 1.47 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And there were a few delays leading up just for the final countdown. There's a problem with some networking equipment. They wanted to make sure that the propellant was tanked in properly. And of course, everybody was very nervous about the hurricane that had just smashed SLS. The damage was minor and like some fabric had been torn off of the Orion capsule, some caulking had been removed. It was it was a little nerve wracking. But in the end, I guess the controllers felt confident enough that it hadn't suffered any damage. And so they made the call to launch the rocket. I don't know if I would have. Um, it's been a while since we've seen this configuration of a rocket take off. And it's it was very surprising to me. I mean, I've seen a lot of rockets launch, but SLS when it is like one of the biggest rockets ever built, it really just leapt off the launch pad. It went so fast, so quickly. And you've got those two solid rocket boosters that are just blasting out these enormous exhaust plumes and made even more impressive because it was a night launch. But then you've got those RS 25 engines, the hydrogen and oxygen engines that burn really clean. There's almost no exhaust plume coming from them. The solid rocket boosters detached right on schedule. Hopefully now they've begun creating a coral reef somewhere off the coast of the US. And then the core stage detached, and it has returned to Earth and those beautiful RS 25 engines now are bottom of the ocean somewhere. And the upper stage made it to orbit. Now it went around the Earth, and then it made an insertion burn to go out to the moon. And now at the time that I'm recording this, it is on its way to the moon, it has sent back a couple of pictures of Earth, which are great. It's just so cool to see these pictures of Earth as the spacecraft is is speeding away. The next thing that's going to happen is it's going to be arriving at the moon in just a couple of days, it's going to do a change in its trajectory, it's going to do an orbit around the moon, and then it's going to do a larger orbit that carries it farther from the Earth than any human rated vehicle has ever gone, then it's going to come back to the moon, another orbit and come back to Earth. Now there's an animation you can see from NASA that shows the total orbit, but that isn't really kind of realistic because the moon is actually moving around the Earth while this orbit is happening. So there's another version of this animation that's actually a lot more accurate. And it shows you how the spacecraft flies up to the moon orbits around orbits near it, orbits it again, and then just like drops back down to the Earth. Now there's a lot more that's going to be happening over the course of the mission. So I'll save that uh, for future weeks, because it's got about another 26 days before it makes it back to the Earth and attempts to re enter. The other impression that I had watching this launch was I was really not impressed with NASA's coverage of the launch. There were no cameras. I mean, I guess maybe we've gotten totally spoiled by SpaceX at this point. But we got some ground tracking of the rocket as it got smaller and smaller and smaller. And then we just got a bunch of computer simulations of it in its various stages. And then finally, when the solar wings had deployed, we got a few more pictures from the spacecraft itself, but but no live feeds from the core stage nothing from the solid rocket boosters, all the various parts of this. And it feels like that's something that they could have mastered. And maybe we have gotten spoiled because SpaceX at this point has mastered giving us a real live experience of these launches. I mean, it's got to be a relief for everybody at NASA. At this point, we've had JWST take off successfully, we have finally had Artemis fly. So now that the actual hardware part getting these spacecraft into orbit is over, uh, you know, maybe NASA can improve the production, the audio video production of these launches, you know, so that we can be as if we were there as well. Capstone arrives at the moon. 
Just a quick piece of news, NASA's capstone CubeSat. This is the spacecraft that's going to be flying in the same orbit as the Lunar Gateway. Uh, it arrived at the moon, of course, after going through an unexpected tumble, NASA was able to get uh, in control of it again, and it was able to arrive safely at the moon. And now it's in its final orbit. And the goal of Capstone is to just give a sense of what it's like being in this orbit that eventually the Lunar Gateway is going to be several years from now. More moon news, SpaceX gets another landing contract for Artemis. Artemis one is going to be flying the Orion capsule around the moon and bringing it back to Earth uncrew nobody's going to be on board. Artemis two is going to take human beings on this same journey around the moon and back to Earth, but they're not going to land. It's going to be Artemis three, when human beings actually land on the surface of the moon. And the plan is, is that they're going to fly up on SLS in Orion, they're going to transfer to a SpaceX starship, it's going to land on the surface of the moon, they're going to get out, hit some golf balls around look for some water ice, then they're going to fly back into orbit and come back to Earth. Now we've learned that NASA has extended the contract they have with SpaceX for another moon landing, this time for Artemis four, they're going to pay SpaceX another 1.15 billion on top of the 2.9 billion, they've already set aside for Artemis three. And this is a little weird to hear because up until this point, uh, we had understood that Artemis four was going to be dedicated to help building the lunar gateway, which I mentioned capstone is already making sure the orbit is nice and safe. And so it's a little strange to me to hear that now in fact, they're going to be including another human landing down to the surface of the moon, the original contract agreed that SpaceX would provide one uncrewed landing to the moon, and then one crewed landing to the moon. And so now we've got the one uncrewed landing and two crewed landings to the moon. On top of this, NASA has also set aside some other funding for other landing systems to bring additional payloads and future missions to the surface of the moon. So the window hasn't closed, it's not all going to SpaceX. But we'll see how this actually plays out. And speaking of Starship, we got a new test. This week, we saw another test of Super Heavy, which is of course, the booster system for the Starship. They ran 14 of the Raptor two engines for a full duration fire and nothing seems to have exploded or set on fire. So I think we're okay. Elon Musk said that there's a few more tests coming, we're going to get a 20 second test next, and then another static fire. And then he figures it's safe for the stack to launch to orbit. Now originally, he had said November, it looks like that's going to be pushed to December, I still say March, but we'll see. I think there's a lot of ground operations that still have to be done before they're going to be able to launch this thing. If you like what we do, why don't you consider joining our Patreon? This is a way that you can support the independent space journalism that we do at Universe Today. We of course have a big team of writers, video editors, audio, programming, all comes together completely independently, so that we can bring you all of this amazing space news. And of course, if you join our Patreon, I will remove all of the advertisements from universe today for you for life, even if you stop becoming a patron, you'll get advanced access to some of the videos that we do, as well as other special bonus features to get your name in the videos at certain levels. So definitely come and join our Patreon. go to patreon.com slash universe today, China continues to cause problems with its space debris. On November 11th, we got the launch of a new Chinese environmental monitoring satellite called Yunhai. And the launch went fine. But this week, we learned that the upper stage of the rocket disintegrated on the journey, breaking up into at least 60 pieces, people have said they saw 50 plus pieces tumbling in space as the debris cloud was going by. And this is bad for a bunch of reasons, like obviously space more space debris in orbit is a bad thing. But the trajectory of this is between 500 and 700 kilometers, which is which is pretty high 
for an for an orbit of this kind of debris, which means it's going to stay up there for quite a while and cause a hazard. Now at 500 kilometers altitude, that's a little higher than the International Space Station, the Chinese Space Station. But over time, as this debris comes down, it will eventually cross into the same altitude as other stations and other important things in space. That's bad. So uh, hopefully, they will stop doing this. Please stop doing this. The brightest satellite deployed. Astronomers are really grumpy about Starlink. And with good reason, because there are thousands of these satellites now in the night sky. They're not visible with your eyes unless you're watching them just after launch and there's big long train and they're raising their altitude. But once they arrive at their final altitude, you can't see them. But astronomers can sure see them when they leave a light trail through directly through the galaxy that they're observing. And this problem is just going to get worse and worse. But we got an outrageously bright new communication satellite that was deployed. It's called Blue Walker three. And it's a new communication satellite provided by AST Space Mobile. And their goal is to provide satellite cell phone coverage with a constellation starting of about 100 of these satellites. It's 64 meters squared, which is like the size of an apartment. That's really big. It is very bright. Uh, I've heard it estimated to be about as bright as Venus. So when you think about the bright objects in the sky, you've got the sun, you've got the moon, you've got the International Space Station, and then you've got Blue Walker three and Venus. And that's just one of them. And just imagine what it's gonna look like when there are 100 of them more. X 37 is back. The Air Force has its own space plane. It's called the X 37 B. They actually have two of them. And one was in orbit and just recently returned after 908 days in space. What was it doing up there? Well, it's classified. They don't need to tell us. Now, it's not completely classified. It had two NASA missions on board. One was to test some various materials in space. And the other was to test the effect of radiation on seeds in space. And so I guess we'll learn how that went. For all of the other projects on board, we won't know. But, you know, people are are speculating or want me to speculate on what it is. And I don't think it's a very exciting list of things that it's doing. It has bay doors that it can open up. And my guess is that it's filled with various materials and electronics that are going to form components for future missions. And so they want to know if we take a brand new computer chip and put it in space for three years, how will it handle it? And so they can fill this spacecraft with all kinds of experiments and equipment, see how it performs in space, bring it back to Earth, study it, fill it again, send it back to space. So it makes sense for the Air Force to have this kind of capability to test out their hardware for long periods of time. But still, it's it's weird that there is this really cool space plane that flies to space almost continuously. And yet we mostly have no idea what it's being used for. All right, those are all the news stories that we had today. Of course, you can get links to everything that I talk about in the show notes down below for more information. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 55,000 people. I read every word. There are no ads and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Josh Schultz and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the master of the universe level. All your support means the universe to us. All right, that was all the news for today. Very space flight heavy this week. We'll see you next week.